Well, welcome everybody uh, to this celebration of faculty career series, which was started in uh, 2013 and really is an outcome of uh, the strategic plan and the faculty of 2020's emphasis on professional development of faculty through uh, different stages uh, of the career. Um, this particular series focuses on full professors who are at least seven years or past uh, in rank uh, and really is an opportunity for these faculty members to both in part provide a reflective uh, overview of achievements in their career but also looking ahead into what exciting areas uh, they are hoping to uh, continue their uh, innovative path forward in. Um, and uh, today, of course, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Arif Kafur. Uh, Dr. Kafur got his PhD in electrical engineering at Columbia University in 1984, after which he was at Syracuse University uh, in electrical computer engineering. And he came to Purdue in 1991. And he's been with us since then with a focus on multimedia uh, um, information systems, on database security, and parallel and distributed computing. And so without further ado, let's worth welcome Dr. Gafur to offer us his uh, colloquium here today. Thank you, Thank you very much. All right. sure. thanks. Well, thanks for, for attending the talk. Uh, let me go ahead and start doing it because I have a long way to go. Um, the title is as uh, indicated here, Models and Architectures for Multimedia Systems, Information Security. Here's an outline of my talk. It primarily consists of two major topics. One is related to multimedia systems, uh, which kind of comprises of my first 35, 15 years of research, starting from mid 80s all the way to the end of 90s. And then I have the opportunity to move into area of information security, which is, has been, I've been working on it for almost 20 years or so. And here's uh, some, some of the topics I'll be discussing. Let me go ahead. As everybody probably is now familiar, what multimedia is, is basically you have combinations of different type of modality of data, audio, video, images, text, and so forth. I don't have any video right now, otherwise this is a nice video to play. Uh, so question is how you compose all this data together, how you store it, and how you communicate it over the network. If you look at the distributed multimedia information system, it is kind of a multidisciplinary technologies consisting of many sub areas, change, arranging from computation aspect of, of different media, all the way to AI and knowledge representation about the contents of the of, of, uh, different type of data sets. So my primary work has been in the area of distributed databases and some work on networking and distributed control. For, for transmission of data. So let me briefly uh, mention what are the uh, requirements for building a multimedia database system. Uh, why, 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 we, why do we need a system which, uh, which should be man managing different type of data? The issues are dealing with not only text, but also dealing with different type of uh, data set, for example, audio, video, text. The question is how you model the information, semantic models of the contents of the different data sets, how you index the information for fast searching, and how you combine information from different modality together and to prepare what we call multimedia document, and how you store this information and how you um, communicate it over the network. Based on these requirements, we propose a, a, an architecture model for a multimedia database system. It's essentially a three-layer abstraction of the system. At layer number one, the bottom layer, you're dealing with individual data type, for example, audio data, video data, uh, text data, images, image database system. And then in the middle layer, you combine, you, pre you prepare, uh, this layer basically essentially deal with the comp com composition and integration of different type of data together in order to prepare multimedia document. And we'll be discussing that in some detail. And then on top layer, which is close to the user interface, allows you to structure the documents, do media editing, and do different type of queuing and searching of the information. At layer number one, the question is, 
if we are dealing with individual media type, for example, video or audio text and so forth, how we can do the indexing of the information for searching purpose? Should we automate the process of indexing of images or video, or should it be done manually? For example, if you are working uh, in a video on demand server and you have to index a large volume of uh, videos, is, can you do it manually or should it be done automatically based on the contents and the information? So the cost versus complexity and the robustness of identifying contents of the data and preparing your indexing mechanism. So the, the main driving force behind this, uh, 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 this uh, automation is the volume of data acquired inspection and indexing can be extremely large. So the question is how we process the information, uh, media data, uh, video data or images, how we can process them and identify contents and represent them. So we're looking to the, uh, our initial work has been focused on, on video data where we look at uh, indexing of motion-based, uh, motion-based indexing of, of uh, events in the video data. And we, there are three, I uh, look at the three approaches. The first one is about spatial temporal logic and algebraic models which have been, uh, which were presented in mid 90s. There's a trail-based uh, trail trail model which we'll be discussing briefly today. Uh, it's uh, abbreviation is video semantic data, data graph model and the trajectory model, uh, which is the kind of a subcase for the trail model. Idea in trail-based modeling is you identify an object, you kind of bound it, bound it with a box in two or three dimension, and then you, to, you trace the movement of the object over, over certain video frames, and then attach time duration and other information about the object so that you can subsequently use it to develop the uh, indexing structure. Now object relations can be, there can be multiple objects you are interested in. And the question is how object relations can be identified or represented. And this is, uh, this can be done by looking at, I'm not doing image, pro I'm assuming image processing can be done at the frame level. where you can identify individual objects, you can tag them, and you can trace them over, over a sequence of, uh, uh, of frames. And then you can represent this information, space-time information, in form of a directed graph. Uh, where the graph is basically bipart as a bipartite graph, where nodes represent objects in the video clip. And then you can have a, a mapping of nodes uh, from the duration of how long uh, the object has appeared based on the number of frames. And also you can look at the motion vector information, how these ob an object or set of objects moving across many frames. Here's an example of a, of a VSTG model uh, taken from a um, sports video uh, data. Here in the first, uh, uh, in the, in the first part of video frames, video segment, you have one or you have two objects being tracked. Uh, there are two players which, are, which have been bounding box and they're called O1 and O2, you can la label them, and you can track them over a long period of time. As new object appears, and you can add another, uh, two, more, uh, two new more, more objects appear, you can also represent them in, in, in the graphical model, they're called O3 and O4. And in the, in the third segment of the video, uh, you can have uh, another object appear, uh, another, another object can appear in addition to what you have already in the previous segment and you can kind of track down all this information in the model itself. So idea is extract the information or the motion information of objects and store them in a graphical model. The question is what I do with this model, with the STG model. What we do is we look at the relationship among these uh, trajectories or, or, or information of the objects. They can appear one after another or they can appear simultaneously, two objects can appear simultaneously so here in this diagram, we're looking at binary processes. Processes can be appearance of objects in the video frame. They can appear together, they can overlap, their appearance can overlap, or it can be uh, uh, sequential, for example, before operator tells you that the, the two objects have, one of object have appeared for alpha amount of time, the other one has appeared beta amount of time, and this is a sequential appearance. 
uh, this is the sequential appearance. Similarly, meet operation means uh, the two appearances have no gap in between. The first one uh, before means there is a gap of appearances. And the third one is overlapping means some of the uh, appearances have some uh, common, uh, common frames. And similarly, you have during operations, equals, and so forth. Based on this information, we have proposed a, a special to, uh, modeling uh, of these events, uh, especially a special event, and then carrying those special events into tem temporal domain. Uh, this is a kind of a, sorry, it's kind of busy slide, uh, but the idea here is based on these binding relations, I can identify the spatial appearances relative to each other, as well as temporal appearances in the, in the time space. Here's an example. Uh, Suppose we have a uh, video frame where we have um, arrow formation by, by four planes. The question is how I can represent this semantic of arrow formation in form of these, uh, uh, these binary relations. What we do here is we take the projections, we can bounding box each object here, and then take the projection on the next y plane or even z plane if you have a depth information about these objects. And then you can use these operators or bind relations, which we call operators also, and develop a, a, a spatial uh, relations, spatial relation uh, with, the, with the logic in it, and or logic in it. So it gives you a spatial um, logic. You can then expand this logic over, over time also. So that gives you a STL model for representing events. So based on this, uh, uh, this quick uh, review, uh, here is an architecture we, we proposed for video databases. Uh, so you have raw video data, you look at the sequence of frames, and at the same time you look at each frame and identify uh, individuals using standard image processing techniques. And you can, uh, which, I'm, which I think there's a lot of work, work has been done on the, on this, on the image side. But then after identifying an image of, of, uh, of desired interest, for example, if you're looking into a particular player or, a, or a, an individual, let's say, president or so and so forth, or even an object like capital building or so and so forth, you can trace them back to the frames. And then over a period of time, you look at their motions with respect to each other within a frame, how they are, uh, they are, they are, they are related, and over frames, how this, uh, their relations evolve. So that gives you some kind of a at least low level semantic of events associated with these objects. So we did a, a small um, implementation of this concept uh, in, um, in um, biological data sets uh, with the help of uh, uh, Paul Robinson he's a, with the Purdue Cytometry Lab. So the idea here is if you look at the cells and see how these cell, uh, cells are uh, uh, interact with each other as uh, over, over time. Uh, we can identify uh, some interested event. For example, um, it can give you an idea of some of the, the challenges which, uh, which uh, bi biologist people are interested in. How we can identify the detection of disease outbreak, how, what is the effect of drugs on the, on the, cell, at the cell level, and uh, how cellular biological processes evolve uh, uh, a period of time. Uh, the idea here is the most at cell level, the information is not only by looking at the standard features, but there's a much more high-dimensional high data set. You can look at the spectrums of uh, spectrum information about the, of the, about the objects in this case, which are, which are cells. So the current HCL, HCL which is high, um, uh, this is a high throughput uh, screening, which is a HTS environment. The idea here is, if you look at these images, they are uh, images of, of cells, they are very dense. And the question is how you can get their features out and how you can look at the state of a cell as they are, they are being treated uh, with different drugs. So what we developed, uh, use our um, uh, spatial temporal model uh, you give a finite state representation of the model. Uh, we call it event detection finite state machines. Each state itself at the lower level gives you spatial temporal events, which I briefly discussed in the previous slides. So here's an example of uh, um, 
I'm still trying to remember these terminologies. Um, this event called phagocystosis, which is basically uh, engulfing of micro uh, engulfing of cells by another microbe uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the biological process. And the question is how you track these, uh, the, this process uh, of uh, uh, phy 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 phygocystosis. Uh, it can be broken down into five different stages over time where the cell comes close to the organism, touches it, enters the, in, inside the organism, and it's kind of diffused inside the organism. That is the completion of the process. So the, the finite state model can be represented, uh, can represent these five distinct events and their durations. And there are all these events follow each other. So basically what we're looking into a meat operation, M stands for meat operation, which are uh, one after another with certain duration or without duration. Meat means they're exactly connected together in time. So the parameters here is uh, uh, you're looking into the, the uh, S represents the duration, sorry, D represents the duration of an event, S represents the accumulated time of the, of the process up to that point, and you're dealing with like say, two sets of, event, two sets of uh, uh, objects. One is uh, they are all putting in the, in the bounding box form, for example, this bounding box represents the main organism, and the small one is represents the cell which has been uh, which has entered the, the, the first object. So what we did is we did some experimentation uh, of uh, about 500 cells uh, from uh, HeLa, HeLa cancer cells, the cervix cancer cells, and they were treated with the um, camptothecine mm -hmm. drug medicine. And the question here is, we want to see the, the effect of the drug on, uh, on these 500 cancer cells. So the, the cell states are represented as, uh, the star, uh, B means uh, live, the cell is live, the early apoptotic, apoptotic uh, state, and then uh, late state when the cell is, is dead uh, as, a, as, a, as a result of the treatment by that medicine. The question is uh, whether the, the traditional uh, cytometry experiment is sufficiently reliable in terms of predicting the effect of the drug. So the, 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 the slide, uh, the, the, the diagram on the left hand side shows the population distribution across these three states. And then what we did is we say, well, if you already track the state of the cell based on this model, uh, you can correct your distribution which turns out to be, uh, uh, which turns out to be better, uh, which is given on the right hand side. Uh, on the left hand side, we kind of overestimated in the live cell, uh, overestimated the ineffectiveness of the drug, but the drug was really more effective than it was uh, uh, thought out to be. And the question is, what, what is the cause of the errors? Well, there are, can be several reasons. You do uh, photo bleaching of the dyes can introduce some error. Uh, inconsistent illumination, illumination of the cells can cause some error. And as well as uh, uh, autofocus, you do autofocusing of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the slide on which these cells are present, and that may cause some error. So the process can remove these errors and can give you better count and indicate what is the real effect on effectiveness of the drug. So, the, uh, so this, this kind of uh, summarizes the first layer of the architecture, especially from, from video database point of view. Now let me move to the second layer of the architecture we propose. Um, uh, the idea here is you take different data sets together and you compose documents. Uh, uh, the document, for this purpose what we did is we proposed uh, a synchronization model uh, I'm sorry, this is a kind of a fuzzy slide. Um, this is a really authentic slide directly from the paper. And I'll promise I'll give you more colorful slides in a minute, okay. So what happened is we can define the synchronization of different media together in time and space by using uh, petri nets and we call it, 
object from position pattern net. This is our, I believe, is one of the main contribution we have uh, in this area. So the pattern net uh, uh, is, is basically a graphical representation uh, in which you have places and transitions, and uh, uh, there are tokens which basically describe the process of representation of the information uh, to the end user. The, the way we did it, the fundamental concept behind here is based on those temporal relations which was, uh, this, uh, which was uh, proposed by Jim Allen in the AI area, you can translate every, every relation into a covalent pattern net. Okay. And if you do that, you can really represent uh, the, the presentation process of a document, including images and text and so on and so forth, by a full pattern net using uh, uh, these temporal models. So for example, it's very easy to understand uh, you can say, okay, we're going to have audio, video, and image together for so long, so on, for, so on and so forth. The text will come later on, and the video can start also after a few delay time, uh, uh, after a brief delay of the started process. So this representation, uh, this model, is is giving much more detail at the synchronization from temporal synchronization point of view, which must be satisfied, and the user side. The question is, if this document is stored far, far, far away from the user site, how do you have the synchronized delivery of the document to the end user? So this, uh, docu this uh, model has been, uh, has been analyzed extensively, has been also applied and modified by many researchers. Uh, basically, the model can only, not only give you end user uh, requirement how the information should be presented, it can give you another idea about how you can develop a um, synchronization protocol for the network in order to ensure timely delivery of the data. Um, you can do storage IO management, that how this data should be pulled out of the storage devices and without any access, uh, extensive buffering at the operating system level. You can uh, also uh, introduce a security mechanism into that, in, in the model, and we'll describe that uh, uh, in a in the later part of the discussion, uh, later part of the presentation. So, idea here is you uh, uh, you look at the you look at the document itself. We can we can uh, we can annotate the do the document OCPN document with other information like how much reliability you want to ensure about video or audio or text and so forth. What is the resolution you want to uh, provide to the end user? If you can have multiple. Uh, copies of the same image, but different resolutions, you can do that. And at what rate you want to present the video data, and so on and so forth. So the, given this information, which is a document specification model, the question is how you translate this requir these requirements at the network level, operating system level, storage point of view, as a security point of view. And how you can go from end-to-end -end point of view, delivery right from the server all the way to the end user. What is the implication on the uh, on, the, on, the, on the requirement of the resources within operating system as well as to the network. Now, uh, this is a study done by, by IBM in Heidelberg, which says, okay, in order to have really, uh, uh, when you're synchronizing information, especially audio and video, there has to be some kind of a synchronization requirements. You should not have uh, 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 out of sync delivery of video and audio data. So for example, if you're doing video animation and the correlation delay cannot be more than 120 milliseconds about the two streams of data, animation data and video data. Video audio, which is called lip synchronization requirement, cannot be more, the slippage cannot be more than 80 milliseconds and so forth. Similarly, audio with audio, when you tightly coupled stereo system, 11 milliseconds is the requirement. So this experiment did it by 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 uh, a whole group of users and try to understand what is the synchronization requirement if there are different type of uh, modality and their um, uh, uh, modality like audio, video, image, and so forth. So what we did is we say, okay, based on the model, we can expand the model and put more attributes uh, for each object. Um, for example, uh, duration of each object that video should be 50 seconds long, the size is 12 megabytes uh, 
uh, storage uh, file, display area on the screen. There's a certain deadline with respect to the start of the document, and rate and reliability, and the content information you can provide. That this video is about uh, our sports and so forth, and the schema itself. So over time, uh, when you look into time, that how this delivery happens, you look from networking point of view that what is the bandwidth required to transmit this data without extend, uh, excessive buffering on the user side. Um, so the, it's a variable rate model. It's transmitting videos with high rate, and then you transmit some text, ignore it, and so forth. Uh, the question is how, you, how network can guarantee delivery of the information without really any dropping of the data set. Um, uh, should the network be looking at every slot here uh, the, based on the, what type of data being transmitted or should look at an average bandwidth requirement on which then the question is uh, anything above this bandwidth must be prefetched and must be stored at the, at the client side so that the data is not is not, is not slipped or not skipped or not, uh, not dropped and you get full reliability of the information. So the, the, the QS parameters for end-to-end -end resource allocation are jitter among multiple clients. Jitter is a common thing. You can uh, slow down the uh, jitter is basically delay uh, between successive packets, end-to-end -end delay, the synchronization of multiple streams, the reliability is, uh, is any droppage allowed. For example, can I skip some frames or audio packets? And uh, what happens if you're dealing with the mobile? user, how this information is, the, this quality parameters are translated into the resource allocation at, let's say, at the base station level or cell, cell station level. Now when, so I'll skip some of the topic of uh, uh, what we did is we look at, uh, we can divide into the requirement or the bandwidth requirement and then uh, this is basically a graph showing you how different, different technology has evolved over a period of time in terms of bandwidth and also how uh, these technologies are already spanning the scope of the coverage. Now, low mobility is, for example, you're talking about fixed devices as a receiver, or portable laptops and so forth, uh, or from pedestrian to vehicular movement, you, what you have is high mobility environment. And you're dealing with two different kind of broad technologies. One is the cell level, the base station level, one is a Wi-Fi level. And what we did is we developed technology for transmission of document, both for both type of mobilities. Okay. So the question is when you're talking about the uh, resource allocation uh, in order to uh, meet the QOP requirements uh, within uh, at, the, at, the, at the low mobility level or high mobility level, there are, there are what parameters you, you should be interested in. What we did some experimentation is uh, a reliability requirement where the dropage of information uh, uh, can be tolerated to some level. So the question is if I'm, if I'm remotely browsing a graph, browsing different document, part of the document or a server, and the, the document keep on coming to you, what you see is a changing uh, bandwidth requirement profile from one browsing item to another browsing item. So the question is, what I need is some information about the bandwidth requirement up front before I start delivering the document uh, from the server side. And the issue become more tricky uh, when you're dealing with the mobile user. Uh, generally, what we're looking into a model where you have base stations, uh, where a user is in the coverage area of a certain base station and keep on retrieving document over the network. And then as uh, uh, he or she continues moving from base station to base station, okay, the, the channels should keep on switching over the internet so that you, get, you, con you, have continue, you continuously uh, receive the desired document without really any droppage in the quality. Okay. So what we did is we proposed um, um, 
4G solution, what called 4G all IP mobile wireless access infrastructure. But uh, the idea here is to develop a uh, overlay protocol on the access point, at the access point, uh, so that I can aggregate uh, the network resources to different user. User may have a high quality requirement, for example, if you are streaming video versus text only, uh, you might be uh, interested in getting more RF channel bandwidth than other user who may be just putting uh, text or, or audio, low quality audio. So the question here is how the resource allocation can be, can be, um, uh, can be, can be performed at the, at the base station level. And so what we did is we say, okay, at the cell level, can we have a buffering mechanism where the cell can itself be the part of the IP infrastructure and which can keep on retrieving data and buffer it, and then depending on the allocation of the bandwidth, deliver the data to the, to the, to the end user. The idea here is uh, there's a speed mismatch. The internal network delay uh, has, a, has, a, has a delay. On the other hand, the speed on the, on the, on the, uh, on the, on the radio frequency channel is much faster. There's no delay there. So you have to kind of uh, smoothen out the disk mismatch by providing buffering mechanism at the, cell, at the cell level. So the question is how different resources can be allocated. Um, uh, resources can be allocated to different type of users. So what we did is uh, we, we kind of did uh, some theoretical analysis uh, that, okay, if the total capacity of the bandwidth is, uh, let's say, C uh, available uh, for the, from the base station, and you're transmitting different objects for different users, how we can distribute uh, the bandwidth to different users. And depending on the number of users and number of the requirement of the bandwidth and, and the availability of the bandwidth, it's quite possible you may have to provide, you have to, may have to drop some information for every user so that everybody can be accommodated. So we can form this uh, optimization problem as a quadratic assignment problem, uh, um, and then see basically can we distribute the, the, the droppage of information across all the users. So this is the work we did in the uh, mid-90s uh, with the Professor uh, Prabhu, Prabhu from Industry and Engineering. He was in reliability and scheduling. So th th this is a work done by my, one of my students. Uh, she graduated in the mid-90s. And this is the first time the, the research paper proposed how multimedia communication should be happened uh, in, the, in a mobile cellular environment. So we did this uh, uh, research at that time. And the, and the idea here is, okay, simple protocol you can design for emission control. You, uh, you run your NLP, nonlinear programming optimization problem. If the solution exists for the newcomers, fine, you go ahead and give the, allocate the bandwidth, otherwise the, the connection can be rejected. And one other issue here is, you may be treating everybody else as equally. There may be high paying customers who are willing to pay high price for high quality data transmission versus low quality uh, paying customers. So what you can do here is, you can define a multiple um, um, uh, service classes and within a class, you carry out this competition for resource allocation, rather than doing uniformly across all the uh, all the users. So the, the 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 question is how this whole fit, how this all this synchronization protocol and uh, network uh, 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 sport fit together. So this is the architecture we kind of uh, proposed. Uh, when we look at the broadband multimedia network layer, on top of that, you have this carry out QS based routing and end to end resource allocation protocol we just studied. Um, and then uh, the issue here is once I have a bandwidth available, suppose I have been given an average bandwidth of 1 megabits per second and 10 megabits per second, is it sufficiently enough to communicate uh, my, my document? What happens if the document is, has a high bandwidth sometime or low bandwidth sometime? What, is, what, what, what should be done once the bandwidth has been allocated? 
So what we look at is now uh, the thing we're just discussing right now is the, uh, the, uh, the middle layer configuration where you have given a bandwidth now based on this allocation as a, even at the cellular level or uh, the internet level. The, the question is how I can guarantee end-to-end -end synchronization then? Whatever the bandwidth I have, I have to live with it and then say, okay, we can do, uh, we can look at the document stream of packers and one option is we dump the whole document onto the end user. If, it, if he or she has enough bandwidth, uh, sorry, uh, um, buffer available, that is great, which is called downloading. On the other hand, if the buffering is limited, you have to slowly release the document over a period of time so that the consumer can consume the, process, uh, the, the document at its, own, at its own pace and without any uh, interruption in the, in the presentation of the, of, the, of the document, especially the, the, the time-dependent data, which is video or audio. So look at uh, different, uh, pro, uh, different uh, mechanisms from server point of view, how documents should be released. Uh, document release means document has been chopped into segments. We call them SIUs and uh, synchronization uh, internal unit, I guess. That's the name. And there are many criteria to design these uh, synchronization protocols from the server side once the bandwidth has been allocated. Okay. Uh, the, the quantity of each of these algorithm uh, protocol is determined by what is the chances of bu uh, buffer being overflow because you are dumping on data onto the, on the client side or you're slowly, slowly releasing the data in which you're underestimating the, the network delay. And what happens is if you, are, if you do a buffer, buffer underflow, you are, you are ready in, out of sync with the document. Uh, the, the, the document presentation requirement. Okay. So these are some of the work has been done, has been published in the, in the literature, and uh, we'll be glad to share the, uh, the citations. Then let me mo move on to the next topic, which is uh, the second part of my work, which I started somewhere in, the, I believe, late 90s, when the Serious Center was established. Uh, we, we have the opportunity starting our research in information security area. And uh, so this is a slightly different topic, which is uh, uh, which we started about 15, 20 years ago. So here my emphasis has been on uh, information security and in particular on, on, on dealing with author authorization mechanisms from user's pers perspective for the, for the information. And we are dealing with the, uh, access to databases. Uh, so one of the uh, strategy used in the literature is called uh, 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 strategy for authorization, which has been used in the literature is called role-based access control, which is a, um, which is came from the NIST from NIST uh, um, uh, model. NIST developed this model. Uh, the idea here is you have a, a set of objects or set of assets you want to share with users and, and the, you have to have some, the user has to have some privileges to access those uh, objects. So the so question is how you control these privileges. Um, you can do at the user level. If there are a lot of users, you have a really complexity problem of managing uh, these accesses. So you can start defining roles, for example. A user may be uh, 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 maybe a, phys a physician, for example, or maybe an um, administrator in certain cases, and you define roles. A role can be assumed by many, many users. Uh, and then roles are, are, have the, uh, have, can, can perform certain operations on the objects, the set of objects. So basically, you have user role, role to per permission assignment uh, challenge. And uh, uh, the question is how this how you can define policies, that who can assume what roles, and how what privileges are assigned to different roles. So the main advantage of our back model is uh, uh, give you uh, efficient management scheme. Uh, you can have hierarchy of roles, which is very natural in any enterprise setting. Uh, and there are also uh, constraints, for example, separation of duty constraints, 
is to prevent fraud, for example, uh, conflicting roles should not be accessed by the same user. For example, a person who's approving a check should, is also writing a check. Shouldn't happen that way. Yeah. Mm. And there are many areas in which uh, 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 access control has been, um, has been implemented. What we did is we say, okay, uh, there should be more than just simple accesses. Uh, there can be more context information you can add into, the, into this model based on time, based on location, for example, uh, where you're accessing information, uh, what time you're accessing information. So we developed this model, which is called generalized temporal RBAC model, GT RBAC model. Uh, and the idea here is role has to be enabled and disabled before it can be assumed. Okay. So for example, you can have uh, different type of constraint in the role, nine to five role. Out of that time, this role is not available, so the user cannot, um, cannot have access to the information. Or it can be event driven role activations and so forth. So it proposed this model, which has also been extensively expanded and analyzed by different researchers. Uh, as an example, uh, you have a, a, in the county clerk office, for example, you can have a tax exemption processor role, tax payment processor role, a tax refund processor role, and you can assign that how when these are these roles are, can be activated, and what type of access they can have on certain type of data sets, reading, writing, changing, or, or so and so forth. You can give the, the type of um, privileges can be assigned. Uh, you can also assign the um, activation constraint that it's uh, only between 120 minutes, within, let's say, uh, two hours to four hours, and so forth. So the issue here is uh, now, um, if we're dealing with federation of information, federation of, uh, of agencies, uh, how different agencies can operate when there's are access privileges are limited? How information can be shared? Okay. So there are two different models. We, there are basically three ways you can do it. One is you can have a tight coupling among the agencies in terms of policy sharing. Okay. So there is a less issue of uh, um, uh, autonomy, more uh, concern is the sharing of information in a, real, in a real sense. And this, uh, the idea here is, if there are multiple agencies, they have their own policies, can we get a global data policy which is consistent? Can we develop it? And at the, the, the point here is, if you do that, there's, you're kind of losing your autonomy. But that is okay, especially for the government agencies because the emphasis is more on sharing rather than protection information, okay? Versus other enterprises, for example, when hospitals are, are collaborating, okay, you want to protect your policy and have it more uh, autonomous. Um, so the first, um, uh, way, uh, the first type of collaboration is called federated collaboration in which you can say, all right, all the agencies or our organization, they must disclose their policy map things together, roles should be mapped. If I'm, let's say, administration in one uh, organization and a covenant uh, boss in another organization, there should be uh, a covenant mapping should happen in terms, of the, in terms of the roles. And then start merging the policies. And if there are any conflict, try to resolve the conflict and coming up with a global scheme. So that when you do the integration, the question remains is, you want to make sure whatever you can access originally in your own domain, when things are all merged together, you still continue doing it. And also, if you cannot uh, access some information in your domain, the global integration should not allow you to do the same thing, okay? So the security should not be violated in any form, okay? So there are a set of uh, policy conflicts can happen Role assignment can change, uh, separation of duty can change, and user specific SOD, separation of duty can also change when you do the uh, merging. So the question is how you resolve, how you identify these conflicts, and how you resolve these conflicts. So here's an example of uh, 
uh, sharing among county offices. You may have uh, um, uh, county uh, billing, uh, sorry, county clerk office interacting with the county treasurer office. And there are some information which are common, for example, social security numbers of the taxpayers and names can be common. On the other hand, information which can be shared across as, uh, for example, you are looking at uh, tax amount, property uh, redemption costs, and so forth. And there are other private information within the offices. So this is a kind of uh, uh, environment we're looking at. And the question here is, if these two agents, these two offices would like to collaborate, okay, what is the issue? Okay. So what happened is, uh, if I start connecting things together, I say, okay, uh, um, in this area of CTO, um, County Tax Office, uh, I guess, that's the name. Uh, I have a, a, a role TCM mapped to, that's a PTM role here, so, so and so forth. So this is a graphical model for the RBAC policy where a, a user can access information after role has been properly mapped. But there's a problem here. For example, this guy, uh, this user view three, let's call this a user, if it assumes this role, this is a permissible here, but this role cannot access information here, okay? But what happened is, if I go across the other site and come back here, okay, I have access here, this access is now permissible, this access is also permissible, I can access information under this role. So this is the violation. Integration will cause this violation. Uh, similarly, you can see other violations can happen. Um, uh, similar, the separation of duty violation can happen. If a user can access this role, he or she should not access that role. Okay. Uh, but also this user can access this role. Suppose this is the given. So what happened is, if I go across the uh, other domain, come back, I can access this information violating this SOD constraint. So the question is how you identify these conflicts. Okay. And how you resolve that. So, uh, uh, so the question is that we, we need this resolution, uh, we need a resolution mechanism. And question is when you're resolving this issue, you must have something under, uh, in your mind that, okay, if I have to resolve it, what is the implication? What is the best way to resolve it? Now, there are many optimality. We can, uh, we can uh, uh, map this problem of resolution into an optimization problem with certain objective function. For example, we can would write to resolve the issue, but maximize data sharing, or maximize role mapping links, or maximize different uh, prioritized accesses, and so on and so forth. Okay. So what happened is you take uh, this graphical model of the RBAC, mo uh, uh, a graphical representation of the RBAC model from two domains, and you can uh, translate this whole model, RBAC model, into an integer programming problem. And the constraints within individual policies are mapped into IP constraints. We propose this approach. Uh, I'm uh, not going to go into too much detail here. So you are minimizing, for example, uh, the weighting vector defining optimality criteria. Uh, 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 you have a, uh, the question here is, uh, A is a constraint matrix, B is a constant, constant vector, and these are some of the Variable, binary variable you use to defining user role accesses. And the question is, what is your, uh, whatever your maximization criteria is, do you, can you get a good solution based on the, on the parameters you're optimizing? So what happened is, we, we, uh, what, can, what can happen when you translate this problem into an IP problem, you can solve it and identify the best solution based on your uh, optimization criteria. Okay. Well, when you do that, uh, there is a trade-off here. You want to maximize interoperation among agencies, but uh, it can cause autonomy loss. Okay. Uh, it can be a reduction in terms of reduction of local accesses. Okay. Uh, so, as new constraints can be implied or can be developed across uh, multiple domains. So there's a trade-off which can be, um, need to be looked at. 
So this was about when you're doing tightly, federa tightly coupled federation of agencies. But what happened is, uh, in another case, uh, extreme case is that I will keep my policy the way I have, and you want to use my resources, you tell me when you want to use my resources. And I'll see if I can fit your request, I can uh, accept your request. So what happened is, if you're running an overall workflow problem, and then I, I, I based on the workflow, I, I can tell, or I can identify that I need uh, some help, or some accesses, and that's in domain number one, some accesses in domain number two, so and so forth, so I can carry out my full work, uh, workflow process. And in that case, what we have developed is, is another methodology. I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, and this kind of a, a model is much more uh, suitable across uh, private enterprises. For example, IBM, uh, IBM has a uh, municipal shared uh, service cloud enabled application integration across many agencies. Uh, in the e-government processes. Similarly, Industry 4.0 is a new standard coming up uh, for manufacturing and production of overflow composition across many enterprises. Okay. Um, so each task of the overall workflow needs to access certain resources. Uh, and those accesses are uh, controlled by the individual organization policies. Uh, and I need to verify, can I run my workflow over all, across all these agencies or all these enterprises? So here's an example of a tax redemption process uh, uh, across, uh, let's say, county clerk office or county treasurer office and district clerk office. So what happens is, uh, as, a, um, as a user, if I make an initial assessment request, the, that request is then transmitted to, uh, to district clerk office as well as the uh, uh, county treasurer office. They take their own times and so forth and get the information back. If I'm doing an urgent request, that can this whole thing be done in 40 hours, uh, 400 minutes, and so forth? Then the, you start looking into a workflow like this. If it's an urgent request process, the question is: Is this mappable to individual policies across these domains? So what happens is the domains can only specify that we can serve you or not serve you. This is all you, they don't tell you, or they do not dis disclose their own uh, internal policy. Okay. So what we look at is uh, 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 looking at this interface specification of the policies. Question is, can we? Uh, is it possible that I can run the workflow across these domains? Okay. And can uh, question is, can verify uh, workflows uh, in, in absence of global meta policy, which is uh, the uh, the previous model we studied. Okay. So the question is how domain policy is specified. We are going to look at the duty outback model. With every policy, every domain has its own policy based on time dependent, which is time dependent. They have their own internal policies uh, uh, running or providing resources on a, on a, on a, a different time. So, um, so we can use this uh, assuming that duty outback model is used to capture policy requirement of the individual domain. The question is, can I map my workflow across these three county offices? Okay. For example, initial assessment request comes to the, uh, to the CCO office, which can then transmit information to other sites, and then they can tell you whether we can finish the job according to, according to your deadlines. So what happened is in order to verify whether I can still compose this urgent request workflow process. Okay. Uh, what we need to do is take the policy, break it into multiple, take the workflow, break into individual workflows for the uh, workflows in the individual domains, and look into the uh, property that is whether the individual workflows, or what we call projected workflows, can be supported by different domains. So here's a kind of a, a, a simple state path discovery process where this part of the workflow has been given to this, uh, this uh, uh, domain, which look at its own internal state model and try to map it. So idea here is you have multiple asynchronous finite state model running uh, together, 
and you're trying to go through these models and see you can coherently develop uh, uh, a global workflow, a verified global workflow across these different multiple, a different uh, finite state machine model, which represent DTR back policies. So given the, your workflow, and this is the definition of the workflow, the question is, uh, can, you, um, can you satisfy these two conditions? That yes, I can support the workflow, and I can meet the timing requirement of the workflow. This is basically the, uh, uh, the detail of this slide is. So this is the architecture which we have implemented, uh, which takes your request of the overall workflow, divide into different segments to different uh, agencies, and then agencies can be like domain one, domain two, domain three, send the workflow to the individual domains, and get the information back whether they can support it. So about to go. Okay, I have to speed up. So here are some of the demos available for this thing. Uh, and, uh, on these tools we have developed. And the last topic is, is uh, looking into privacy versus access control model. The idea here is if you're sharing information, are you, um, um, are you protecting information from each other? Uh, the idea here, uh, the question here is, what is the trade-off between the privacy and access control? So I will uh, um, kind of quickly go over it. Uh, um, you have access control. If I, if I let me. The point here is: so this is the information which are, which needs to be disclosed, um, and you want to protect a, 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 a protect individual information. So what you look into the process of what we call generalization, in which you kind of uh, uh, take the informa individual information and put in uh, bigger blocks. And so that the individual IDs cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, disclosed. Individual information cannot be disclosed. Uh, so what we use is, uh, for the privacy purpose, we use K-anonymization technique, uh, which is the generalization of the approach in, in the relation database system. Uh, if given an access control of data, you want to generate generalization techniques and so that uh, we, the privacy can be preserved. So we look into this model, and the question is, uh, can I enforce certain privacy requirement at the cost of losing some access information, or at the cost of increasing access beyond my limit? So can I increase the scope of my access and can still ensure privacy? So that is a trade-off, okay? The more, if you want to, Increase your scope of the, you should not be increasing too much scope either. Okay, my access should be limited. And in, uh, so that I can uh, state a law, privacy, I can meet the privacy requirement. So this is a research which we did. Uh, the solution turns out to be uh, 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 complex problems in, in terms of uh, finding these anonymization uh, uh, blocks. And I will, quickly go over it, and uh, that has a set of uh, algorithms is proposed because the original problem is uh, NP-complete. And the idea, has, let me summarize quickly here. Um, uh, the, the K is basically the number of blocks you are merging together, okay? The higher the value of K is, the better uh, utilization of the information is. Uh, uh, by the same time, what happened is, you're, you have to give up a lot of access. That is basically the, uh, the vertical axis is indicating, okay? Uh, so there's, that is a trade-off we want to highlight in this slide. And here's the system we have implemented for this uh, anonymization uh, technique for the relation data. We have extended it to streaming data as well as to graph data. The graph data is very important for us because in currently most of the social networks are graph data and you want to protect your privacy as much as you can, not in terms of your IDs, but also in terms of association structure. Who are your friends and how far they are, they're connected to you and so forth. Okay. So let me we put multimedia document security together, the first part and the second part, and the idea here is I can look at the OCPN model presented. Question is, I can protect some individual uh, uh, 
individual in the, in the let's say in the video or audio frames, as well as looking at the different level of resolution of images, and which can change the, the OCPN model and put this security information requirement inside the model. That if the viewer is an adult, can go ahead this way, if it is a, the child, take a different path of presentation. Different object must be structured. And this is the structure of the new uh, tool, the multimedia database system with, with the security model implemented. So the la la last thing which is a tool we developed in which a user can, can, can com compose their own information. That if you are a, if you are a, uh, if you are a physician or you are a patient or you are a health provider, both can, all these parties can uh, access information but in a, in a very, as a, as, a, as, a, as a patient, I'm the owner of the data. I should know who can access it, who should not access it, and where it can be accessed. So we have this, uh, this uh, tool available. Um, uh, this is the tool for this, uh, uh, for this uh, kind of access. Well, originally, we designed it for, for Facebook. We, 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 we filed the initial patent, but somehow, University did not encourage us to go forward. And it turns out after we have this uh, paper ready, Facebook came with this model, how to protect uh, individual information at the Facebook. Uh, so. so currently, this is a, what we're looking into now, building a Zillion server-based system. We're more looking into now threat management uh, across the system, how to detect the threats what are the response and recovery mechanism. And some of the challenges we're looking into the scalability aspect of a large scale CBS and real time response and recovery. Okay. Uh, we started with the, some work on cloud data center as part of the CBS and recently published some work on this area. At the end, I would like to thank all the uh, sponsors and collaborators, uh, as well as the most important one, the graduate students and the colleagues and collaborators uh, within the department across the campus and from other institutions. I'll be glad to uh, <laughs> the Sorry for taking more time, more than oh, okay. I know I've been having. Sorry, rushing through the whole presentation. There's too much to cover, uh, but I try to condense into some of the key um, projects we, we, we did, which I believe has a, um, some major impact. Any questions? Uh, as I said, my research kind of shifted toward more on security. I think there are some more interesting challenges in security, uh, which is a, which is kind of a new learning for me. Uh, so, I'll, for near future, at least, I can continue working in the security area. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, when Sirius was established, the center, sure. um, they started uh, uh, a seed funding project. And I look at the modeling work we have been doing in multimedia, like pretty net model, the final state model. And I see there's an there's a opportunity for us for modeling point of view, especially the GGR back model. So we were successful in getting that seed funding, but then it pan out into many NSF funded projects down the road. Uh, I can say it's a sheer luck, I guess. Uh, yeah. uh, but we have been constantly getting funding from NSF. The current work we're doing is with North Grumman for the last few years, for developing a, a kind of a theoretical basis for developing a resilient uh, CBS system, which is, can be for the CPS, cyber physical system, or IoT systems, or uh, cloud data centers. So I found that very exciting. 
but we may have access to some real data uh, to that uh, partnership. Questions so we in your interactions with uh, when you were thinking that uh, algorithm and trying to um, the security uh, and then you said that Facebook actually got uh, intellectual property on a very similar yeah. idea. Um, I mean, if, what what is the reason for? It? I mean, is is it that it's uh, that this is such a cutting edge that? People who are evaluating these things here don't know uh, enough about, uh, you know, I mean, so something fell through the cracks here, right? So it was a good idea that was maybe ahead of its time, and then, you know, we find Facebook comes through with it. And I think that uh, two things happened like that. Uh, the student, uh, uh, Arjuna Samuel, he, who was, did uh, this project, as a, we have a student from uh, Canada School. They found a very good job with uh, with, uh, with Microsoft. So <laughs> they started right in the middle. I said, no, they have to leave. Uh, also, we got some funding from, from from the university administration, but then we signed for the VC to, to send a proposal. Um, we were to say, well, there's no hope for this technology. Uh, there's no potential in this technology, and that kind of set. Was another setback for us. Um, so naming this, uh, the students left, that it was a major issue. Second thing is that the, uh, the VC, VC funding was, uh, they don't give us encouraging remarks. Although we see Facebook doing the same thing later on after six months. They talk every user can, can protect information, access can be given to their friends or, or, or relatives, which is essentially the model we developed in IPM. Just Great, and in the interest of time, let's give Dr. Kapoor a Thanks, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, absolutely, I'll be glad to. Thanks, I'll be